Today I want to caution you to be careful what you teach because, well, someone just might learn it. Hey, what's up? I'm Ken. This is Ken for TV, and each week I release videos in the martial arts, philosophy, technique, training, that sort of thing. So that's the kind of thing you're into. I hope you stick around. Hope that you subscribe and share and and enjoy this, because really, at the end of the day, your enjoyment is what this is about. Also, each week, last week's video is released as a podcast, audio only, for the people who would rather just listen to these things. And lastly, if technique-based video is more your speed, you'd rather see cut application or or weapons handling or things like that. Check the description below for a link to the Dojo Sessions playlist where you get to see some of the, my thoughts and theories on things from a physical perspective. Someone once said to me, be careful what you learn because you can get really good at something that will get you really dead. And that stuck with me. That's something that I've thought about a lot and something that I've carried for a long time as a teacher, knowing that people come on the mat all the time for a lot of different reasons, but mostly one specific one, They've chosen to trust you to teach them what they think they need. They believe that you're there to provide it, and they trust you that you're going to, which is why I think it's so important that we pay attention to the fact that if we are teaching bad lessons, if we are teaching bad techniques or dangerous things, someone might just learn them, and someone's life may be at risk. Worse yet, as teachers, we pass this knowledge to other people, and then guess what? Those people pass it on to yet more people. And especially they move away or do things like that. It could literally spread throughout the world these lessons that maybe weren't very good. I and mean, we're going to talk later in this video about some of the things that I think we can teach wrong. And then next week I'll talk about some of the ways that I think that we can actively correct these kinds of things. For all my Hikite fans out there, you know what? To be honest, one of the lessons that I learned a long time ago was that this hip, this hand pulls to the hip in order to generate power when you throw a punch. The harder and the faster that you throw that hand back, the harder you deliver a punch. So much so that it was almost that the more emphasis was placed on the hikite, the pulling hand, than, than was on the actual striking hand making impact. I can also remember clearly teaching that punch to a friend of mine, another instructor in a different art, and we were sharing knowledge and I was sharing that punch and I was trying to reinforce why we punched that way. In some ways I was trying to validate the reason I did it the way that I did and not the way that he did. So I was expressing the, the reasons that I believed in it because it was what my instructor had told me. And he learned it. He took that. He tried to understand it, tried to incorporate it into what he did and tried to process all of that information. I look back now and I, and I feel remorse for having shared that knowledge because that knowledge is out there now. And I don't know how many people that he passed that knowledge to, let alone all the people who actually came on the mat and trained in our dojo where that lesson was being taught. That is how information spreads, and that is part of the danger. Fast forward to now, I know that that's not true. There's plenty of science to back up, lots of reasons why that's not true. And then you look into the word itself, my understanding and my pursuit of knowledge when it comes to the languages used and, and exploring the culture and that, I realize that the word itself, it means the pulling hand and that there should be something in it. Old texts reference the fact that you are pulling and twisting limbs and things like that. You're clearing things out of the way in order to hit. That hand had a purpose, and its purpose was not delivering power into a punch. Not directly. It could deliver power by pulling something into you so that you could hit harder, but meanwhile, if you were hitting, there's this idea that you're, that you're leaving part of yourself open by pulling that hand to the hip when you punch. Let's talk for a second about that because truth is I think context is important and if you are striking and you're pulling your hand to your hip, is it the smartest move? No. If there's nothing in it, it's not the smartest move. Is it the fastest way to re-chamber and hit again? No. It's not. Is it going to get you hit? Maybe. I know. Sacrilege. But here's the thing. If you are sport fighting, if you are dueling with someone openings are really, really critical. You've got to pay attention to those. You've got to lock into those. But if you are dealing damage to somebody preemptively or, or in a different kind of situation where, where you're not testing each other out and, and watching for each other's weaknesses, that moment might come and go and you might never be punished for it. 
there are contexts. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about. Let's bring up two of the main ways that I see things taught um, inappropriately. And the first is teaching self-defense techniques that don't work. Dangerous, incredibly dangerous to teach somebody that this is what you can do to protect yourself. Only to have in a stress-tested environment or, or situations, an actual situation that that technique would never actually work. It would never succeed because in that situation, when the, the heat is applied to it, it falls apart. Everybody trained it in a compliant situation with no stress and worked through it until they understood how this thing worked. And I can think of dozens of things that I've learned along the way. And this is important to realize I am not trash-talking the knowledge that I have. I was taught very well. I have good knowledge. I feel... I feel Proud of a lot of the things that I do know, I just recognize that there were things along the way that even going back to my instructor and discussing them, we don't, we don't necessarily agree with them that they were part of the curriculum, and so we continued to pass them on. But later, as we continue to look, we realize they weren't actually very good at doing the thing they were supposed to do, or they were a low percentage. We'll come back to that. Self-defense techniques taught in a sterile environment that only work in a sterile environment will get people killed. Now, you can hope that the majority of the people that ever step foot on your mat never end up in a bad situation, and thusly, it never becomes a problem. Nobody ever learns that mistake, and nobody gets hurt. But the problem is, because of that not happening, the knowledge continues to pass because we never learned that it was bad, that it was inappropriate to teach. Sticking to the self-defense context, in that context, we have this concept of women's self-defense. And we come in and very often we see, here's what to do if somebody grabs a hold of your hair or grabs a hold of your wrist or tries to hit you, or tries to stab you, tries to cut you. The statistics don't back up that that's the most likely scenarios that are going to happen. I mean, wrist grabs, the way that they're taught, I, I do believe wrist grabs are important, but they're taught from a perspective of you just offer me your wrist and then I grab it and that's what we do. It's not how those wrist grabs work. There's so much more context around that, the concept of where your head's at, and it's probably a discussion, and your wrist is probably being grabbed because you're trying to leave a situation that you feel like is done. We're done having this conversation. I don't feel safe or whatever. I leave, and someone grabs you trying to get you to stay. So you're not even in the right posture that is taught on how to deal that situation, let alone the rest of the context that, you know, it's just glossed over that's probably somebody you know. Yeah, but it's not... Nobody wants to talk about the emotional parts of the fact that you might really not want to hurt this person. You might really struggle to do what's necessary. This person might have been grooming you for the past six months or a year or longer in your relationship to be submissive and to not struggle with these situations as they bring them to you. These kinds of things are left out of those lessons. And then the whole, like, punching and, like, here's how to deal with a punch or here's how to deal with this. That's just not typically how it's going to go. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we can make sure that we prioritize the right information. Now, notice I said prioritize because it doesn't mean that the information you're given was bad or wrong. It just means that maybe it wasn't the most important. Next up is the idea of the sport context techniques being taught in a self-defense context. A lot of schools teach their self-defense curriculum, but, but a lot of the concepts are born from a sport context of what of how those things happen and what their likelihood of success is and that sort of thing. So they start to prioritize techniques that work really good. And then you start seeing a lot of things heavily invested in if whether or not your feint landed, if you did a good feint in order to be able to, to land that hit, or um, when they move this way, you'll move that way, and these kinds of things that happen in a dueling scenario. But that's not the context of the self-defense. Arguably the most important thing you should have heard in what I just said is that the context dictates whether or not it's appropriate. It doesn't mean that it's a bad technique. Sport technique taught for sport reasons should be doubled down on. People should spend more time. They should emphasize that. If they want to be an athlete, a performer, somebody who's going to put that into their rotation as something that can help them win a bout or take a tournament or go, you know, to the Olympics, whatever, then you got to get good at those things. But very often, a lot of those things, because they worked well in sparring, get taught as things that will protect you if you need to defend yourself. But sparring doesn't happen the way that protecting yourself does. And people don't react the same way 
as somebody who's got a programmed response in their dueling method, especially let alone somebody that you train with regularly, who you know what they like to do, they know what you like to do. And so everybody kind of plays off of each other's things. When was the last, especially let's target the whole stranger situation. When was the last time you had a stranger where you immediately just magically knew what they like to do and how they liked to respond to things? You don't. When are you going to figure that out? So fainting to see how they move. I don't know. There are people who, who are not trained, but can fight very well. And they're good at real violence. And a lot of those people don't flinch at all when you faint. And in fact, many of them will go ahead and just hit you. They feel that movement and they just lay you out because that's what they're programmed to do. That's what they were trained to do. So you're relying on a circumstance that you're familiar with and then putting it into a context that it doesn't apply to. And therein lies the danger. We determine a method that works really well. We teach it in the way that it works really well. You practice it in the way that it works really well with compliant partners who understand all of the aspects of it working well. And then you can take that away and put it somewhere else and it falls apart, but people have spent time preparing themselves to use it and they don't understand that it's not going to work. This is the danger of context. Now, I don't want to dig too far because next week's video is the one where I'm going to address how we go about handling this and, and, and appropriately dealing with it on the mat and how we go about making sure that we're teaching the right thing the right way. Another huge concept that we don't pay attention to, that we have to pay attention to, is just general safety. Not whether or not you can do that technique, but whether or not it's safe for your body to even learn it or, or apply it. If I have incredible flexibility and then I decide that you need to learn something and you don't have that, but I decide you should just do it the way that I do it, you could get injured. If you have previous injuries and I don't pay attention to that and then you go do it, and I, and I had the knowledge of your injuries, but I told you to go ahead and do it anyway, that it was fine, this is going to be just fine, and then you get hurt, that's on me for not paying attention and not making sure that you do it safely. Plus, there are just things that are just dangerous to do. If you're not careful, you're learning how to do falls or throws or things like that, and you haven't gone over any way to protect somebody in when they're being thrown, and then they get thrown, and they get hurt. If you are not including the stuff to keep people safe, then you are creating environments in which people get hurt. And then another one is this idea of teaching something too soon before somebody is mature enough to be able to apply it appropriately, understand when it's good, when it's not good. You know, my instructor would always say, yeah, we don't need kids knowing how to break necks on the playground. You just have to make sure that the things that you teach are, are age appropriate, maturity level appropriate, and and anger level, mental health level appropriate. Just because you have someone who's a full grown adult doesn't mean that they are mentally connected in a way that's going to make sure that they don't abuse that knowledge. Also, try to understand why they're trying to learn a thing. If they are a person who is prone to bad behavior, giving them more tools is the wrong answer. You just slow down their training and make sure that that's not happening. So that was kind of two for one. That was one on, on making sure that just the thing that you're doing is physically safe to be performed and then making sure that you are not teaching something to the wrong people, that the wrong people are learning the technique. So lastly, I'll just leave you with one more context that I think is really important, and that is the low percentage techniques being taught with a high priority. If you've trained for a while, you can probably think of a technique that fits into this category. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't be taught, but when it's taught as the high priority, then it becomes something that people put emphasis on. They train hard to become good at, only to find out that that situation is so unlikely to happen, or it's so unlikely that this technique would actually be successful. It's more of a Hail Mary, you're out of options, you need to do something. But it becomes the first thing they want to try because the emphasis was put that this was useful or important or appropriate when it wasn't. Percentage of successfully landing whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish has to be considered every time. And that right there might be the summary of all of the other things that I just mentioned, which is how likely is it to succeed in this context? Would it work when it needs to work? If it doesn't, it's dangerous. People can get hurt. They can trust that it's going to be okay and that it's not. They can trust that they can accomplish it when they can't. They can trust that it's not going to go poorly, that it will lead to success or safety or, or whatever it is that they need to accomplish when it just won't. So be careful what you teach. Pay attention to the fact that there are many ears listening. You might 
be questioning and doubting and working through the process of understanding whether or not these techniques would work or how they'd work or when they'd work. And you might know exactly when you would or would not use that. But if that is never conveyed to your students, they just use blind faith to trust you. And that is a heavy thing to carry, but it's a real thing. When people come to learn, if you have an establishment, when they walk in the door, there's a trust already there. They already believe that there's a reason why you have this place. Surely you must know something. And if they get on the mat and they feel like that is confirmed, then they'll trust you even more. They'll trust you explicitly. And then you can ask them to do things that they should never do or train them to do things that they should never do. And they will. And it is your responsibility to make sure that you are not abusing that. So that's it for this week. Next week, we'll tackle all those things. We'll tackle how do you go about making sure that you're not abusing those things? How do you go about making sure that techniques are appropriate and, and taught in a good way? How do you go about vetting a technique to make sure that it is a good thing to teach and it's appropriate to begin with and that it even works? And how do you go about teaching things that you want to teach even though you understand that there are areas that they won't work in? But you need to make sure that people, people get that knowledge too. That's next week. That's what we'll talk about. If you like these videos, you like videos like this, here's another one that you might like. Here's that playlist of that dojo session stuff, the technique-based stuff that you might like as well. And then lastly, here's where you can go to subscribe to this channel so that you know when new videos come out. Don't forget to hit that bell so it tells you when they do. I'm Ken, this is Kenfu TV, and I'll catch you in the next one. Yeah.